EJP soil webinar introduction to soil sensing. Um, this is a first of two webinars. Um, first today we have uh, an introduction to proximal sensing and in two weeks time we will have uh, the one on remote sensing. Uh, together with my co-hosts uh, we have a webinar for you today which will take about an hour. It consists of uh, four parts, an introduction and then three um, uh, elaborations uh, which will, uh, yeah, a bit more will be uh, spoke about in a few uh, moments. Um, afterwards we have a small discussion. Uh, so um, between the parts of the webinar there is space for some um, uh, clarifying questions and some elaboration if needed, but please save your uh, topics for discussion until uh, the discussion after the webinar part. Um, you can put your questions in the chat uh, during the webinar, then we have a little backlog. I will try to keep track of it a bit and uh, see that the questions get to our right presenter. Uh, and with that, I would like to give the word to uh, Johanna to uh, start it all off. Okay, so welcome to this first part of this introduction to soil sensing. Uh, let's see, let me... So, which is about proximal sensing. Um, so me, my name is Johanna Wettelin, and I'm a soil scientist at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, SLU, at the Department of Soil and Environment. Uh, and me and two of my colleagues, Christine and Mats, uh, will have this seminar. So it will be a little bit of Swedish examples, perhaps. And as uh, Jost said, the, the outline of today is uh, so this is really an introduction and the introduction will start with an introduction with some definitions and an overview of different types of sensor techniques uh, and then we will have three sections with a little bit more focus on a couple of these uh, applications and sensors so electrical conductivity which my colleague Christine will talk about I will talk about soil spectroscopy in the visible near and mid infrared region and my colleague Mats will talk about gamma ray and PXRF and then hopefully we will have about 20 or 30 minutes left for questions and discussions. So with that I think I'll start the first session so the introduction. So I will start with a definition. This is a definition that was is in a paper by Viscara Russell and a number of other authors from 2011. And according to that definition, uh, proximal sensing is the use of field based sensors to obtain signals from the soil when the sensor detector is in contact with or close to within two meters of the soil. So this uh, definition. Uh, actually exclude similar sensors being used on platforms for remote sensing like satellites uh, and also laboratory measurements using the same sensors. However, it is recognized also even in that uh, paper that for some sensors the development is mainly done in the laboratory, but also there is a lot of interesting applications from laboratory analysis. So we will partly include that part two in this, in this uh, webinar. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's um, a lot of different sensors and the thing that uh, connects them is that they're used in the field to measure soils on close range. So what is the point or why will we use proximal sensors or sensing? And of course, it's the main reason is because the measurements are usually cheap uh, and fast. So it means you can make a lot of analysis of many measurements um, with these type of techniques. And the sensor signals correspond to some physical measurements and that can be related to soil properties. Um, Quite often, though, these uh, 
relationships are indirect. Uh, so you need to make a calibration model uh, for the sensor where you have where you relate the sensor measurements to traditional analysis on soil samples. So this means that each individual measurement from the proximal sensing might be less correct, but you get additional information just by the fact that you get so many measurements. That's the, the reason or the reasoning. Um, and then there is also this thing that quite many of these sensors, they are affected by more than one soil property. That can be different or difficult when you want to, if you want to predict a specific soil property, but it can also be um, a good thing, a useful thing. If you want to have a measurement of like an overall estimate of soil variation or some sensors, for example, are quite well correlated with soil fertility, uh, like um, correlated to yield maps, for example. So then you can use the census for that too. It's not. Um, and one other thing about the proximal sensing, you can think about the scale. So if we talk about field measurements, or farm scale. Uh, so you use it for for quite detailed uh, information on the soil. If you also talk about the laboratory measurements, you can talk about anything from field up to European scale, of course. But for the field applications, usually it's field of farm scale. So what can you use a proximal sensing for? Um, so let's say that you have this farm and you have uh, a sensor and you've been measuring it in like trend lines across. You have a lot of information. And that information could be used. So this is an interpolated map of the sensor measurement. And you can use it, for example, to guide soil sampling, sampling to make sure that you get uh, that you cover all the variability that you see in, in whatever it is that you want to sample. Or you can use that same information, for example, to delineate fields or into zones that you believe is more manageable. You could also use the sensor measurement uh, to increase the number of analysis that you have. So if you, instead of this very dense sensor measurements. Maybe you have more of a point measurements with the sensor, but you have it quite uh, quite many samples. But the soil property that you're interested, you only have in a few samples. You can use the sensor measurements and make a calibration and predict uh, the rest of the samples that you didn't have. Uh, traditional analysis on to be able to still make a detailed soil map. And of course, if you already have a, a general calibration, you don't need to make a, a local one. You can go directly from a sensor measurement using a calibration to uh, to come up with estimates of the soil property you're interested in. Or in some cases, some of the 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 sensors used actually give direct measurements. So you can just by using the sensor measurements directly get the soil property that you're interested in. Um, as I said, there are many types of sensors that can be used for proximal sensing and you can divide them or group them in different ways. One division is to uh, so to, to look at how they measure or operate. So for example, if you look at the measurements, it can be a non-invasive or it can be an invasive measurement. And if it is an invasive measurement, it could be in situ or ex situ, for example. And what does this mean? Well, the in situ measurements, maybe you have a sensor that you put into the soil and drag, so the sensor has contact Diana, you are muted. 
so sorry. Have I been muted for a long time? No, no not so much. No, <laughs> but, just the uh, last seconds. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, I was talking about the ex situ would mean that you would take up the samples, either a soil sample or um, and do the measurements so in the field, but outside the, the soil. The sensors can be passive or active. So that means that either they produce their own energy, uh, like a light source, for example, or they just uh, use the energy uh, coming from the soil or the sun. The operation can be mobile, like on the go, or it can be stationary, so that you go to a spot, do an a measurement, and then go to another spot. And the inference can be indirect, which I would say is mainly the case, but it could also be direct. And these images here are just some examples of different operations of different instruments. So this instrument, for example, uh, measuring electrical conductivity would be uh, an on-the-go measurement, uh, an active sensor, a non-invasive with indirect inference, for example. Um, and uh, another way to do to group the sensors or the used for proximal sensing is on what they measure. And there are a lot of different techniques. Uh, we will I will just mention four of them. Uh, mechanical, electrochemical, electrical and electromagnetic, and optical and radiometric. And mechanical is uh, probably the oldest one. It's uh, in a way the easiest one. It measures mechanical resistance in the soil and soil compaction could be a draft force uh, measurement on a regular cultivation machinery, or it can be a more uh, like a horizontal penetrometer. Electrochemical sensors are some of the sensors that actually you can, um, can measure directly, sometimes what you're interested in, like plant nutrients. Uh, so it's usually iron selective electrodes and it measures concentrations of ions in a solution using iron selecting membranes. So pH, for example, uh, is one of these uh, things that can be measured using a commercial um, sensor like this. Electrochemical, electrical and electromagnetic, so not electrochemical, um, measures electrical conductivity. And this is something that Christine will talk about. As so I would just say that they can measure direct contact or through magnetic induction. And these are sensors that has been used quite a lot uh, in, for example, in precision agriculture. And the last, uh, but not at all least, uh, group that we will talk about is the optical and radiometric group. And this is a group containing a lot of different types of sensors using the electromagnetic. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, <laughs> wavelengths, at least in different wavelength ranges. So all from gamma ray up to uh, microwave. And Matt will talk about these sensors using gamma ray and X-ray. Uh, I will talk about sensors using visible and infrared um, range, but there are also um, sensors using microwave ground penetrating radar. We will not talk so much about that. That's mainly used in uh, um, archaeology. So it's it sensors that send out microwaves and measures the time and the strength of the signal coming back. And it's good at detecting differences in layers in the soil. So differences in so the contrast and in conductivity between um, materials in the soils, like a stone in the soil, for example, or a metal object. So this was this very short and fast 
overview. Um, and I would now like to give the floor to my colleague Christine to go more into detail on electrical, electrical and electromagnetic sensors. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Johanna. So then I will uh, start sharing and I will share this screen and show this PowerPoint in presentation mode like that. So hello everybody. Uh, as Johanna mentioned, my name is Christine and uh, we all in this seminar work at the Department of Physics, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, where we focus on precision agriculture and pedometrics. And what we want to do to a large extent is to understand the spatial and temporal variability in crop growth conditions so that one can adapt uh, management practices accordingly. And uh, so we are very fond of these types of tools because you can use them to quickly get an overview of spatial variation in a few fields or a farm or even a landscape. Oh, I was hoping I was going to be able to change slide, but yes. So uh, when we talk about electrical conductivity, there are two main sensing techniques that we use for this, and uh, these are uh, some schematic uh, figures taken from the literature. You have the source here. Uh, the first one is that you can use electromagnetic induction, where you have a, a coil that um, produces an, a magnetic field which generates a current in the soil, which in turn uh, generates or induces um, another current that is measured by a receiving coil. And the, the secondary um, magnetic uh, field is dependent of the e electrical conductivity of the soil. And the other method, uh, you do not measure the electrical conductivity, but it's inverse, the electrical resistivity. By the way, do you see my pointer? This going around here. Yes, it's possible. Yes. Okay, it's good. <laughs> so uh, then you have, uh, uh, you directly inject a current in the soil and you meet the potential at different distances from, from this injected current. And just to show, there are many different instruments for this. So these are just two examples. This is an electromagnetic induction sensor. Uh, it has no contact with the, with the soil. It is non-invasive and there are um, you, um, there are coils for um, inducing a magnetic field and measuring the secondary magnetic field in this one. And you can drag it along the field with a vehicle. Here is an example of the direct current method with uh, these disks where you have injecting disks and disks measuring the potential at a distance from that. So you can use these types of instruments. This is another electromagnetic induction sensor. Uh, by putting the sensor on a sledge and uh, linking it to a vehicle and driving back and forth over a field, while at the same time you have a positioning system that logs measured values together with position. And one may wonder why we have this very long, long, uh, line here and that is because this instrument that is based on electromagnetic induction is very sensitive to metal so we don't want the metal of the vehicle to uh, interfere with the measured values here so if we do that and go back and forth of a field we can get data like this 
here we have gone with our our sensor back and forth and we have gotten electrical uh, conductivity values if uh, just as an example if we go with 10 kilometers per hour it's possible to go a little faster than that but we can do that in our example and if we go with uh, 12 meter between tracks i think in this field it's actually 24 but let's say 12 meter between tracks then we will cover 12 hectares per hour uh, which makes it very possible to do a field in, in a few hours depending on the size, of course. And it's common to log one uh, ECA value per second. And that means that you get about 300 uh, measurements per hectare. So then you, you really see the capacity of this instrument to quickly as assemble uh, values across the field. So this is a 30 hectare field, and you also see it in this picture here. And here is an area with uh, high ECA values. And because I know this field, um, I know that here is a clayey valley, while here we have lower uh, ECA values. And that is because here we have a more sandy soil and a bit, um, a bit of a hill. So this is the more clayey value, valley you see here. And when you look at your data and look at it like this, it's possible that you need to clean it a bit. Uh, there may be some erroneous registrations. Maybe you have recalibrated the instrument halfway and you need to, to uh, join these two halves together. So there may be a little bit of work before you, you get the data ready for use. So each one of these registrations, now talking about this instrument here, the electromagnetic induction sensor, it has an, um, it gives you electrical apparent or bulk electrical conductivity values. And, and this is a benefit of this instrument that it, it is affected by the electrical properties of the soils of a larger depth. So it's not just the surface of the soil. Here we have the depth below the instrument. And here we have the relative response. So between the two sensors here with one meter between them, this is the depth response curve. A lot of the value depend on the electrical conductivity in this area here. And here you see the same thing, but in a cumulative response. So you can see that about 70% of the signal is from the top 1.5 meter. And in this sensor, you also have another receiving coil, uh, 1.5 meter from, from the transmitting coil, and then you get a, a shallower depth response curve. And you can also flip the instrument on the side, so the coils are on the side, and then these two uh, also gives these other two depth response curve. So one of these measurement points in the previous picture is actually you get um, two um, ECA values. And if you flip it and go over the field again, you can get additionally two values. Uh, I have actually never used a direct current sensor myself. So this is from the literature, but also with this other method, measuring resistivity, which you can invert to uh, electrical conductivity. You get, can get different depth responses depending on the distances between the injecting sensor and the potential electrodes. So the electrical properties of a soil, the electrical conductance. Here you see a schematic picture, oh, sorry, uh, of the soil. You have uh, solid particles, liquid and air, and the electrical currents go through the liquid and the solid particles, and the conductivity depend on the electrical properties of these uh, materials and the relative composition of them. And when you get your 
uh, ECA value. Uh, it also depends on the on the vertical structure of the soil. So if you have a subsoil that is more conductive, you have a lower value if if that is further down, <laughs> where the sensor is less sensitive, compared to if you have a um, thin, not so conductive topsoil, but a, a relatively shallow, more conductive subsoil. So if we have collected electrical uh, conductivity values with a number of different depth profiles, you can do an inversion of it. A theoretical theory is explained in this uh, uh, bionumerical solution, and you can uh, estimate the ECA values in specific depth intervals of the soil, which can be quite useful sometimes. One thing to think about when doing these measurements is that, at least for the electromagnetic induction sensors, the air they are sensitive to air temperature. So if you measure for a long time over a day when the temperature in the morning is colder and it becomes warmer and then colder again, day, this will affect the sensor. There are models to compensate for it, or you can repeatedly recalibrate your, your sensor to handle that. And the electrical conductivity of the soil depend on the water content of the soil. So if you do a measurement of a field and then you come back a few weeks later when the moisture conditions are different and do the readings again, you will not get the same values as you did two weeks before. And if you have to choose, it is better to, to measure when it's somewhat wetter compared to somewhat drier because in really dry conditions uh, you have lower conductivity and thereby a smaller signal to, to noise ratio. So these are things to be aware of. And also if you are going to measure many fields and combine them to a map of a watershed or something, uh, this um, moisture effect can uh, make you have to adjust the values a bit for them to fit together and not get between field differences. OK, so what to use these ECA maps for? Uh, ECA uh, depend on or covariate with a lot of soil prep properties that are interesting for farmers and agronomists and other. Uh, if you have a sal saline soil, salinity is very much dominating the variation patterns of the ECA. But in non-saline conditions, clay content, organic matter content, macronutrient content, and also depth to a layer deep down in the soil with a very contrasting ECA. For example, bedrock, which has very low conductivity, or clay pan soil, which has very high conductivity. And depending on your specific area and what uh, has the largest variation range in your field or farm or watershed, uh, it will um, decide what has the strongest covariation with its ECA. So uh, there are often correlations, but they are time specific and they are site specific. So with this instrument, it's very difficult to develop calibration models, for example, against clay content that you can use in the same field at a later occasion or in another field. You need to do local calibrations and current calibrations. So how to use these maps? Um, as Johanna already mentioned and gave a nice example of, they are good for guiding soil sampling if you want to cover the variation in your area. And because of the correlation with these soil properties that are all important for crops, water content, clay content, etc., uh, it's a useful query to delineate management zones of a field if you want to split it in more fertile and less fertile areas. For salinity mapping, of course, because that is more or less what you are me measuring. And as a covariate for soil mapping in 2D, 
uh, or if you first want to to separate uh, ECA for different layers of the soil and do a 3D soil map. And I just want to show a small practical example of the latter, how we did it. Uh, this is an 800 hectare watershed in Sweden, and it was it took some weeks covering it with measurements. So this is about the capacity of what you can do with sensors. Going to entire regions or nations is difficult. But we did ECA measurements with four different depth responses, and then we converted them to ECA maps for three specific depth intervals. And we didn't do it just mathematically, but we used this probe here, which also has an ECA measurement at the tip. So we used that for, for splitting these depth integrated values into three specific depth intervals. And then we took soil samples and sent for the lab for in a few points, 50 points in this uh, uh, 800 hectare area. So we could do soil property maps for the three depth intervals. It, it was on clay content and soil organic matter content. And the reason for doing this was that uh, another research group was uh, working on modeling risk for phosphorus leaching, and they needed this data for both in depth and across scale for this watershed. So, so then we had produced the data they needed for their, for their work. So in summary, um, ECA uh, sensors, the good thing with them is that you can quite easily cover areas, fields, farms, watersheds on the go, and you can also get information on soil properties at depth, which there is not so many proximal sensors that can do. So, so that is one of the benefits with this sensor. You need to think about that ECA varies over time and it covariates with different soil properties, several of relevance for crop production, salinity, clay content, organic nectar content, macronutrient content, and if you have an area like that, uh, also depth to higher or lower ECA. But one should remember that these correlations are very often time and site specific. So general calibrations most often don't work with the ECA uh, uh, sensors. And um, common uses are to guide soil sampling, to delineate homogeneous fold, zones of your measured area to map salinity or to use as a covariate for mapping other soil properties. And that is what I wanted to say for now. And I will see if I can stop sharing this somehow. Thank you for the presentation, Christine. Um, I have some two short questions in uh, in the chat. Yes. Um, maybe you can elaborate on that. Um, your uh, screen is still shared, by the way. Yeah, I'm trying to sort that out. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now yep. I don't share anymore, do I? Yes. Um, Penny van Egmond, uh, she asked. Um, uh, dear Christine, you mentioned that depending on soil moisture content, measurements uh, that are taken two weeks apart will be different. Could you indicate how repeatable the patterns are in time? Can you trust the patterns, if not fully the values? Yeah, from um, maybe I can't give a general answer, but mm -hmm. um, when we have done repeated measurements of the same field several times, the high values are the high, uh, the high areas are the high areas and the low areas are the low areas, uh, even if the absolute uh, values uh, are not the same. So from experience, I would say yes, but I am sure there are cases when that is not, not true, maybe. But um, 
often yes, I would say. Thank you. Um, also, um, uh, we got a question from Roberto Barbetti. Uh, do you have some examples with 3D maps with EMI sensors? And if possible, with which method? Um, I thought maybe that is also something if you have links for that, that we maybe yes. can share in the presentation afterwards. Yes, there are several uh, examples in the scientific literature and I add, it was maybe not visible here, but if you go into the presentations afterwards and click, you can see that. And also the last example uh, there where we uh, did this 3D uh, soil map of this watershed. Uh, but I can put some more examples in the PowerPoint to guide you to further literature on this because it has been done quite some, quite a lot. Yeah. Thank you. We'll uh, make sure to, uh, to add that. Um, and then um, I guess we have two small questions remaining. After that, I think we move on. So first, uh, Yusi Knapi. Um, we have some data over the time, uh, very stack EC gear zoning seem to be very re repeatable. Oh, that's an um, elaboration okay. on uh, what you already uh, said. Okay, thank you. Good to know. <laughs> um, and I think the last one, um, Olfet Erdal, uh, can this method also make precise measurements in mulch soils? Uh, I would think so. Um, I haven't tried, so I cannot promise, but um, I don't. Uh, in different soils, the spatial variation depends on different things. So um, if you have an area with a strong variation in clay content, the variation in ECA will depend on the variation in clay content, I think. And depending on what governs the variation, spatial variation of ECA in your area, if that is linked to what you want to know or not, um, it will um, um, decide if, if it's useful for your uh, application or not. But uh, it can be good to, to test. In many countries, there are... Um, companies offering a service for farmers to to go to the field and measure their fields with a sensor like this. At least in other, our country, there is a company like that. So maybe you can hire the service before you decide to invest in a, in a sensor of your own and try it. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Johanna, do you think we uh, have time for some more questions or should we move on to the next topic? I, I think maybe we will move on and then we, we keep the questions are still there in the chat and we have hopefully we will have a bit more time after um, yeah. just to make sure that we get all the sessions there. And I mean, we if we don't have time to answer all the questions in the chat, we will try to answer them through emails as well, I think. So yeah, or we can include them uh, in the uh, maybe the slides afterwards with a short elaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, so yes. then, yeah. So then I will continue with a little bit about um, I will share my screen again. Uh, I hope you see it now. Uh, so now. We move to another type of sensor group. So the visible near infrared and mid infrared sensors for soil sensing. Um, and um, I will make sure to be able to move, change slide. Yeah. So these types of sensors, they are passive or active sensor that measure reflectance in the visible and near infrared or mid infrared wavelength range. And what you see in this image is uh, a spectra of a soil, uh, and it's in the visible and the near infrared and all the way in the mid infrared uh, region. 
This is the definition that is used mainly when you come from a proximal sensing community or uh, chemical, uh, if you're um, chemi chemists. But if you, for example, talk to people using the same sensors, but on remote sensing platforms, usually they have different definitions. So this can make this a little bit um, uh, difficult sometimes. So for example, in, in remote sensing communities, quite often near infrared is referred to only this, this initial part of the near infrared. So from about 700 to 13 or 1400 nanometers. And the other part of what I call near infrared is quite often called uh, shortwave infrared, or sometimes even mid-infrared. And the portion that I will call mid-infrared is sometimes referred to as thermal infrared or medium wave infrared or long wave infrared. So there are a little bit of a confusion in terms of terminology, but from a proximal sensing point of view, the near infrared will be from about seven 780 nanometers to 2500 nanometers, where the mid infrared will start. So that's the definition that I will be using further on. And we measure reflectance, but what is important is what is absorbed. So that's why usually we transform it to absorbance. And it's more common perhaps to see the spectra like this. So the vis visible and near infrared is usually shown in nanometers, while the mid infrared is wave numbers. But uh, the information that is visible in these spectra are due to absorption of energy at different wavelengths of the material that is uh, that we're looking at. And in the visible region, the absorption is due to excitation of electrons. But in the longer wavelength regions, so the near infrared and the mid infrared, the absorption is due to vibrations in chemical bonds within molecules. And these vibrations, so these molecules, the example here is a water molecule. It can, it can, these bonds can vibrate, they can bend or they can stretch in different ways. And these different vibrations absorb energy at different wavelengths. And it also depends on these um, bonds. It depends on what molecule they are in, where exactly the absorption is. So by using that information, you actually get uh, information on the material in the soil. The fundamental vibrations usually takes place in the mid infrared region. And with that, it means that the, that absorption is usually stronger and more precise. While in the near infrared, it's mainly it's overtones and combinations of the fundamental absorption. And this means that in this region and a little bit also in the mid infrared, but the absorptions, so the, the pattern, it uh, overlaps and not so strong absorptions patterns. So to be able to manage this, uh, we need to use multivariate calibrations because you get a lot of information uh, and you cannot easily say that by looking at one point, uh, tell uh, what it, uh, anything about the con what the material consists of. You can look at it quantitative, qualitatively. I mean, you can look at the mid-infrared spectra. You can say, okay, this seems to have quite a lot of organic matter. Um, you can look at different peaks and say something about what it consists of. But if you want to make quantitative analysis to say something about the amount, you need to make a multivariate calibration. And these re reflectance spectra, if you look at the soil, uh, so primarily it contains information related to water, soil organic matter, clay minerals, and soil texture. And 
other soil parameters that are related to these, like, for example, um, cation exchange capacity. So just uh, as an example, it is not possible to directly relate the spectra to pH. Because hydrogen concentration, that's an ion, and that, that is not a bond. <laughs> so it doesn't have uh, any vibra vibrations. So it's not visible in the spectra. However, the spectra have information on soil um, things that is related to buffering capacity, like clay and organic matter content. And if the pH in your site is very clearly related to the buffering capacity, it is possible to indirectly estimate pH. Or if pH in your uh, site is related to carbonate content, because carbonate content is visible in the spectra. But as Christine also mentioned earlier, with most indirect correlations, they are often very site specific. So it's not easily to move one calibration for pH, for example, from one field or site uh, to another. And these are a few examples of spectra. Uh, they look a bit different compared to the other ones you saw. This is reflectance, so it's not absorbance. And they are transformed using um, continuum removed. So they are, that's why they look so flat. These are visible near infrared spectra. And this is to show some differences related to mineralogy and organic matter. So they are all dry samples. The topmost one is uh, a soil, a Swedish soil containing a lot of elite, uh, which is visible through some of these peaks. This is related to water. Uh, the red one is the soil from Kenya, and it's a, an older, much more weathered soil using diff, um, containing a different uh, clay mineral, so like kaolinite. And you can see that by a very clear double peak in this area. Uh, the blue one, for example, is a soil from Iran, which has a lot of gypsum, and that also shows a different pattern. And the bottom one is an organic soil. And here you can see the effect of the organic matter. It Organic matter has effects on specific wavelengths, but it also has a very general, broad um, effect on the spectra. It broadens the water-related peaks, and it also has a very big um, influence in this visible region. So this is some examples of qualitatively looking at uh, visible near-infrared spectra. This is just to comment on wavelength ranges of the instruments, because there are now a lot of different instruments. And if you, visible near-infrared is used a lot for looking into vegetation, so plants. And for if you, if that is what you want to do, the region up to, let's say, 1100 nanometers is quite sufficient because you have a lot of information which is interesting looking into plants. But if you want to look at soil, you do have a lot of in good information here, but there is also quite a lot of information further down. So for soil, uh, and especially for some things like clay content or minerals, it's uh, also interesting to have a sensor going all the way to 2500 or about. Uh, this is just also something showing that water has a high, has a large influence of, uh, on the spectra. This is a visible near spectra, a couple of spectra, the dry spectra at the bottom, and uh, uh, more and more water. And you can see that the uh, albedo is increasing and the water peaks are broadening. So you, you miss information with a lot of water. This is a mid-infrared spectra showing the same things. This is an organic soil. This is a mineral soil. And this is a wet sample or a fr not a super wet, but a fresh, so not dried sample. And on the top is a dried sample. Um, one of the reasons for this change in, uh, in general uh, Albedo, it could be that when you have water-filled pores, you get an apparent absorbed energy, which is not related to the chemistry, but only to the fact that the pores are water-filled. But what 
what this means is that since water has this big effect, it of course has an effect if you want to make in situ measurements. And especially if you have a varied uh, water content, which is usually the case. Um, there are both laboratory and field instruments. And one general thing is that it's easier to make to do vis near infrared measurements in the field if you compare it to mid infrared. So mid infrared measurements usually require more sample preparation. You used to you need to grind the samples not only to sieve it, for example, um, and it's more sensitive to water. Um, and many of the applications is actually done on laboratory analysis, uh, where you use uh, spectral libraries. Uh, but even then, it's it's cheaper than using some of the traditional uh, analysis. And there are instruments for field analysis now also for mid infrared, like this example, for example, and quite a lot for near infrared and a lot of a really cheap census is coming out. I will just give three examples uh, of some uh, applications of using near infrared. Uh, it will be near infrared, not mid infrared. And this first one is a little bit what I already showed you. This is on, based on laboratory analysis, and it's a uh, farm soil mapping. In Sweden, it's usually done one sample per hectare. Uh, but it, all of the analysis is not done on all of the samples. So then if you have sensor measurements near infrared on all, you can use those spectra to select a good calibration data set uh, that you analyze traditionally. You build a local model and you predict the rest of the samples, and then you can make a nice um, um, detailed soil map. Another laboratory uh, example is, which is common, there is there are a lot of national libraries, spectral libraries. Uh, we have a Swedish one too, with about 12,000 samples. And you can, of course, make these national models based on laboratory measurements. So we have a good, it's in Swedish, but <laughs> we have a good clay model. Uh, and this is a model for organic matter. But we often want to use these in a, in a local context. We want to use it for, for farmers, for example, within their own farms. And then it's interesting to see how these national models work in a local context. And that is what is shown in these leftmost. This is clay and this is soil organic matter. And as you can see, the using the national model as it is, uh, just on a, uh, to predict uh, on a farm level is usually not super good and you have quite a big bias so you can see there is a relationship but the errors are, are, are large uh, and you can use a smarter or more localized national model this is a, a memory-based learning um, version or um, technique and it improves it a bit for both clay and organic matter at this farm. If you use only 10 local samples to make a calibration, it's it's not super good because it's, of course, very unstable using only 10 points for building a calibration model. But if you instead use those 10 local samples to localize your national model, you can get a very nice result. And this localization can be done in different ways. In this case, we've done what we call spiking. So you add 10 local samples to your national uh, database and you remodel. Um, but it can be done in different ways. The, the main thing is to use local information combined with an, the national uh, information to make a better prediction. And I will I have the very last example, which is finally a field <laughs> analysis uh, using near infrared. And in this case, we use the same sensor as Christine talked about. So this is a multi multi sensor uh, 
equipment. So you measure insertion force, force, uh, visible near infrared and electrical conductivity. And we did that on two fields. And we tried to use it to predict clay, sand and soil organic matter. And we tried to take, we did the probings with the sensor and took samples very close by for this calibration. And in conclusion, so in, in most of the cases, this the combination of more than one sensor gave the best results. But in fact, it was rather small improvements. Uh, so in this case, if you have everything in the same at the same time, uh, so it was little extra effort, then it might be worth doing it. But if you would have had to do three different measurements, it would not have been uh, worth it. And the visible near infrared sensor was the best single sensor for all tested uh, properties. However, for clay content at these two fields, the electrical conductivity was almost as good. And it turned out that then using only the near infrared range was best for clay and sand, and including the visible range was best for soil organic matter in these two fields. It was also uh, the case that the near infrared combined with the insertion force force uh, was best for soil, con soil organic matter content, but the near infrared combined with EC it gave the best results for clay and sand. But these differences differed between the two sites. So it was not uh, a gen, it was uh, more clear uh, on one of the farms. So that was uh, a quick thing about these sensors. Uh, I will stop sharing now. If I find the right. So. Uh, and I don't know if there are any quick questions now or if we should go directly to. Uh, to Mark. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, yeah. I think we have some uh, quick questions uh, that we can uh, do now um, and some things that we better save until the discussion. Um, in one of your slides, you used a centimeter um, uh, minus one. Um, yeah. uh, uh, what's the meaning of that in the unit for uh, the measure of wave number? Yeah, I was afraid that question would come because <laughs> I could not uh, fully explain that. Uh, it's it's the thing is that in the mid infrared, when you talk about those sensors, you almost always um, talk about wave numbers instead of nanometers. It can be recalculated to nanometers, mm -hmm. as you saw in the, the other slide. Um, I don't have it in my mind, in the top of my head, how you do that recalculation. Uh, it's not very difficult, but it's... Um, and I don't remember now why they use wave numbers. It comes from the chemistry. So it's, it's the, the chemists use that. <laughs> That's my, if Mats or Christine has an, a good answer, they can say it, but uh, yeah. Then uh, <clears throat> I think that's maybe also something that uh, we can uh, do a small elaboration on uh, in the in the slides when we, uh, when we yeah. send them around. Uh, then it another short question was, um, is it possible to produce comparable or any soil analysis using remote sensing methods um, for the types that, that you discussed? I mean, that's a little bit what will be discussed, I guess, in the next seminar. Uh, yeah. So to some, some degree, um, yes, but one big difference mainly is that, of course, that the, the resolution is, is very different in terms of uh, uh, I mean, in, in the, from a remote point of view, you will have all of the issues with the water content and different surface conditions uh, affecting the measurement. You only measure uh, the very top soil. In many of the remote sensing applications so far, it's also not a hyperspectral data, but a multispectral, so you have less information. So in theory, yes. In practice, perhaps not always so easy. Yes, thank you. 
Um, and also the last one, what is IF in the last slide? Yeah, sorry, it's insertion force. So it's ah. it's not, uh, it just means the force needed to push down the probe in the soil. Um, do you have time for, I think we should move on to, uh, yes. to the next part. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for all your questions in the chat. Um, we will uh, certainly take a look at them and uh, try to uh, do our best in explaining uh, in uh, in when we uh, present the slides back to you. Um, and with that, uh, moving on to uh, our next speaker. Thank you, Anna. OK, so. Hello, I hope you hear me. Tell me otherwise. Um, so I'm not so strong. I work um, with uh, as Christine and Johanna at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Uh, I will talk about the uh, gamma ray spectrometry uh, and portable X-ray fluorescence, uh, two different methods um, that may be of interest. Um, and proxim uh, the, the gamma ray spectrometry. Uh, what it does is uh, it trying to sense the amount of natural gamma radiation that's the from the from the from the ground. That's the the principle. Whereas uh, portable X-ray fluorescence or PXRF um, is a you can say a lab technique that has been moved into uh, the field in a way since these uh, instruments now are portable. Um, but I will start by talking, start, start with the, the gamma ray spectrometry. Okay, and, and both these methods are, they belong in the uh, very short wavelengths, uh, very nasty things, uh, gamma rays and uh, x-rays uh, in principle, a bit uh, unhealthy uh, things to, to deal with in a way. But in this uh, case, when we use it, it's not really um, dangerous in a way. <laughs> it's uh, the natural gamma rays that we are uh, dealing with. And the X-rays are supposed to be um, handled in a way so they are not dangerous also. But we will come back to that a bit. Um, gamma ray spectrometry then. Um, what was What is measured is it, it, mainly the three naturally occurring, I can try to switch to another point of it, maybe. Actually, I can't switch. Make alternative. Okay. Um, what is measured is mainly the three naturally occurring radium elements, uranium, thorium, and potassium. Um, sometimes also cesium. Uh, that's not really naturally a natural element. It's it's man-made from uh, nuclear uh, industry, atomic bomb tests and uh, accidents and things like this has caused this uh, cesium, which is measurable also. Um, and in the context of soil science and agriculture, it has been shown that it's excellent actually for mapping soil texture in the topsoil very often. It's, it's very useful uh, for that. But also uh, it is used and uh, it has been used, of course, uh, also in a, a long list of different topics, um, yeah. especially geological surveys. Um, th that is actually when this method has been developed for and um, prospection of minerals and, and also radiation monitoring. That's the maybe the initial um, uh, uses of the technology. But now in, in our, our context, we, we use it more in the in the soil, looking at the soil. So in this area, this is in southeastern Sweden, it's about 30 square kilometers. So if we look at the um, um, gamma ray spectrometry uh, over this area, you can see 
a lot a, a number of different colors. Mm, if we combine potassium, thorium, and uranium as red, green, blue, you get a map of the different colors. And in this case, we have the bluish areas, which are in this case glacial fluvial deposits, which in fragments from black shales, so it contains a lot of uranium. Um, and you have greener areas, which are sediments uh, high in clay content. And you have uh, other colors that are sort of related to the geomorphology and the ge geology and the soils of, of the area. So you can see that it's, it generates interesting information. Uh, the gamma rays, uh, they come from unstable atoms. Um, and when they decay, uh, there's an emission of uh, uh, radiation. Uh, and you have uh, alpha radiation, you have beta radiation, and you have the gamma rays. These elements that we are looking at, they are have a very, very long half-life. So they have been around since uh, um, the, the, the universe uh, was formed. I mean, the, the, the half-life is in, in that range of, uh, of years. Um, and so for these elements, you have different decay chains and the uranium 238, which is, uh, which is uh, what, we, what we mentioned, um, it decays with to down to the to lead when it sort of stop, stops decaying and then it's stable. Uh, the gamma radiation is um, that we measure is mainly from, from this part of this chain, actually. So uh, we don't really measure, we can't measure because it's too little energy. So we, we the gamma is mainly in this part and uh, this is measurable. So this is. And so so this is how it's done. Um, and the instruments that are used for this is uh, detectors that sort of collects all the photons that are um, emitted. And then um, in this process, um, um, gamma radiation is uh, converted into um, energy and the counts of, uh, uh, of, the, of the photons. And then, so you need some, some time and you need a, a size of the, of the detector to be able to, uh, to collect uh, enough information to produce um, a quantifiable amount of radiation, you can say. And then there are different methods to interpret this uh, Sometimes so the, the, the main peaks are analyzed, and sometimes the whole uh, spectrum is, is analyzed as well. The units that are used is, uh, in this case, often percent for potassium and, and parts per million for thorium and uranium. And sometimes you also see the specific activity, uh, becquerel per kilogram, and it, it, it can be converted back and forth. One thing that is a bit difficult with the, the gamma ray spectrometry is the, uh, to understand or uh, yeah, the, the footprint of the measurement. It's really a very large area that contributes to, uh, to the data that is collected. Um, and it's a bit fussy, you can say. So it's uh, as you can see in this sketch from uh, from this uh, publication, uh, you can see that there is a certain area that is giving you most of the um, uh, information that are is recorded. So you, there is a you can say a rough guideline could say could be that four times the height above the ground, uh, that's the sort of the footprint radius. And then you can say that most of the, um, the data comes from the upper, say, three decimeters or something like this. So it's, the, it's mainly the top soil that contributes to the, uh, to the data that is recorded. 
uh, but it's a, a rather large area depending on the height uh, above the ground where, where the sensor is. And then also you have to think about the velocity of um, the carrying vehicle. Christine mentioned that with the EM instruments you could travel with 10 kilometers per hour or 20 kilometers per hour even. But here you need to go slower normally with uh, if, if the sensor is rather small, which is uh, normally when, when we carry carry it around or move it around in the field, uh, then you need to go slower. So it takes a bit of uh, time to measure also. Um, but it, this it depends on the, the type of the detector and the volume of it. And this is different platforms from where you uh, often measure um, with gamma ray uh, uh, spectrometry. Airplanes, uh, low flying airplanes, then you have very large uh, detectors. So then you, you, you fly with like 200, maybe 50 kilometers per hour or something. Very low, uh, often uh, 60 meters or 100 meters, something like this, um, even as low as 30 meters. That was the normal in Sweden to do before. Then there were some accidents. Now they go on 60 meters uh, height. And that's the geological survey that do these measurements for geological mapping and mineral expectation and also radiation uh, monitoring. Uh, and that is actually a very good source for, for digital soil mapping, this type of uh, data, if that is available. Um, then now also drones have been used for this. Uh, since the drones have been more <laughs> stronger and powerful, they can lift heavier um, equipment. Uh, these sensors are quite heavy, so you need a very good drone to do this. Um, and you need to fly rather low uh, and slow. So, but in certain situations, the drone can be very useful uh, for, for gamma ray um, sensing. Typically in agriculture, um, some type of vehicle um, have, have been used where the instrument has been mounted on. And, and as the same as we heard before, you, you log data continuously while going over the field. You can also go around uh, manually and do measurements. Uh, this is one example when we did a test with the drone. This is a very large drone uh, and it carried three different sensors at the same time uh, with different volumes. So, so, so this one is rather small, relatively um, uh, light to lift, so it sort of suitable for a drone, whereas these uh, are heavier and require a, a quite big uh, drone to be able to be carried. And then also uh, this this sensor was mounted on a on a tractor, so there was a comparison. And we did uh, this in a field. Uh, this is about 400 times 800 meters uh, large area uh, where we have some sandy soil up in this part and we have clay soil in this part. Uh, you see some numbers here is the clay content uh, in blue and the sand in red. Uh, so it's quite a large variation and um, so this is an example of what you can see from the thorium uh, from the tractor borne scanning and this is the drone borne scanning with the same sensor. The drone borne scanning was done on 20 meters height, uh, whereas this one was uh, just above the ground. You can see that there are similarities, but also some differences. Um, the footprint when you fly on 20 meters above the ground is much larger, whereas here you have a small footprint, so it will be less less details, but uh, it will be, I mean, similarities uh, despite this. And you see the clay content uh, on, on these numbers here. And the correlations are really, really good between the clay content and the thorium in this case. Um, and also the sand content is inversely correlated. So, so you, you can see that in many cases, uh, this type of sensor is really useful for uh, soil texture. However, Depending on the geology and uh, uh, so there might be situations where you have different correlations. So 
this is an example from Germany, uh, where the in some fields you have this expected positive correlation between the, in this case, the total counts uh, and the clay content. Whereas in some other fields, you have a totally opposite uh, correlation, uh, which is in this case explained by uh, differences in, in the uh, geology, uh, parent material in the soil. So you need uh, still maybe some <laughs> local calibrations uh, to be able to use this in a good way. OK, let's jump to the portable X-ray fluorescence instrument. This is a totally different type of instrument, uh, a sensor that is not really useful. You cannot really travel and measure continuously. You need some, some time to do your measurement. Um, and X-ray fluorescence is the emission of energy from a material that has been excited by being bombarded with high energy X-rays. So in this case, this instrument emits X-rays and then uh, there is an interaction with uh, the soil in this case, and you have uh, energy coming back from the, from the uh, ground to the instrument, which also has a, a detector. And this technique has been used in many different uh, uh, areas. Uh, agriculture uh, is uh, only one, maybe also quite late, uh, you can say, um, um, area that has been this has been used in. Um, measuring like different metals, that's a very simple thing. If you if you go to a uh, Scrap, scrap metals and pieces, they, they can be quickly measured and you can see what type of um, uh, metal it is. So, and that's a very easy uh, way of using this instrument. But you can also use it for many other things. And it's actually, as I said before, it's a lab instrument. The X-ray for XRF has been around for many years and a very powerful instrument for detecting a long list of elements. But now you can, you can, have it in a portable uh, manner also, so you can you can move it into the field. And what you what you can measure is heavier elements. So you can say from magnesium and heavier, uh, there is a possibility depending on the type of instrument and the setup and the calibrations and whatever. You you can measure uh, a long list of elements. Um, one thing that is a bit um, well, could be annoying or limiting, you can say, is that you require time uh, to get a good measurement of a soil sample. Um, it could it could be a number of minutes um, in order to uh, to get a good stable reading, and that depends on that the, the concentrations are very low in the soil, uh, and it's also I mean soil is a bit you have some matrix of particles with some air and whatever. So it's it's um, it's a tricky uh, object to measure on, you can say. Measuring on a metal object is very, very easy and quick. So you can get a result quickly in comparison. So you can use it in the field. You can also use it in the lab, This the field instrument in the lab, uh, if you like. And, and if you use it in the field, so, uh, water content is an issue, so it, it should be a dry soil. Uh, and um, also it should be as homogeneous as possible. That's also very good. Uh, and one thing also, it's a bit difficult to get a representative sample because the measurement is really a small volume. It's just a few millimeters, less than maybe a half a centimeter depth. And then you have a, also a small uh, surface area. So then you need to do some repet rep repetitions, uh, sub subsampling maybe to get the representative sample. So there are, this is an issue. There could be safety and uh, some regulations uh, that you need to um, take into consideration because this technique is a bit, it's X-ray, so it's a bit, um, um, you need to be, follow some um, certain uh, 
necessary uh, rules to be able to use it uh, outside of the lab environment. And then you have the time issue as well. But the question is, is it possible really to measure on soil directly in the field and collect some representative data? I can show you some something from a small test we did uh, some years ago when we went out in the field in some different fields. We measured with this instrument in uh, six uh, spots around a center point. We also took soil samples from the top soil and analyzed and we did comparisons, but I will only show you the, the difference if you take those three samples compared to these three samples and make an average. And these diagrams, they are three different elements that were recorded, zinc, thorium, uh, calcium. The triangles are same points, but in the lab, that's the whole sort of topsoil and then homogenized and dry. That should be the best uh, sort of data. And then you have the points, the black points are untreated sample in the lab. So that's the sort of topsoil, but not really done anything more than just measuring on it, but repeatedly. And then we have the, the diamonds here. There are the field measurements. So and this is the median of the A, B, C, points and this is the median of the DEF point. So you can see for some elements here, actually it was fairly possible, you can say, to do measurements in the field, which was sort of similar to what we got in the lab. And also these three points were similar to those three points. So in principle, you can say that, okay, it looks like it's possible to do a measurement in the field. Then for some other elements, depending on how easy it is to measure uh, with the instrument and also how big the variability is, then you see some more noise. And so for calcium, for example, the field measurements were a bit uh, noisy. So so there it is a challenge to do measurement in the field, but it could be possible. But you need to be uh, uh, careful in how you, how you do this. One last example of how you can combine PXRF with gamma, um, and this is an example of national mapping of copper in arable topsoil in, in Sweden. Uh, we see all the points there, actually the same points as Johanna showed before the national uh, soil uh, um, data set that we have. Uh, and in a number of those, copper has been analyzed in the lab, and then we also measured with PXRF. In the rest of uh, the samples, P only PXRF was measured. And then we, there was a prediction made uh, on copper on all on these samples based on this uh, uh, data set. And it, it sort of worked quite well. It's, uh, this is published by Adler and others. Uh, you can look at it. And then uh, this was combined with gamma and other covariates. Uh, <clears throat> And in this case, the gamma was measured from from airplane. So it's not really proximal, but it's uh, fairly proximal. Um, um, and then there was some digital soil mapping, machine learning was done, and then from this uh, concentration maps of copper was produced and also some other risk maps and other, other things that was useful. So this is an example of how possibly you can you can use these different methods. Uh, this is in one scale, but you can also do the same same thing on a field scale, or maybe even better on a field scale because working on a on a large area it generates more um, issues than if you have a sort of similar soil to look at. So it's easier to to do this in a smaller area. Okay, to summarize. Um, Gamma ray spectrometry. This is it's possible to use for many platforms, and it's really good for in, often uh, uh, for topsoil texture uh, mapping. Many other uses as well, uh, and but you need to do local calibrations. Sometimes you see people that are using gamma ray spectrometry for many other things like phosphorus and pH and things like this, and and there is actually no really. Um, um, you cannot 
sort of say that there is some physical explanation why this should work. Uh, I would say that if it is correlated to the parent material or the topsoil, then texture, then then it might work, but you need to do and check uh, with local calibration. So it's not uh, a universal instrument that can be used for everything. You need to you need to be careful there. PXRF, it's a type of lab instrument that moved into the field, and you can you can do a direct analysis of a range of elements that can be very useful, especially in environmental studies of different types. Uh, so you can you can get a quick estimate of of um, the amount of heavy metals, for example, uh, in some cases. Uh, you need to think about that there's a, is a very small volume that you measure on, and it's also rather time consuming. Uh, so you need to to select your um, time when you do this, uh, and so and also need to be a bit careful when you do your measurements, so you get a representative sample if possible. Uh, you can also use it in combination with the other sensors that we have been talking about today. Two examples of where you can read more is two PhD thesis um, that we have been involved in. One about gamma uh, and one about PXRF and the digital so mapping. So you can check it out after. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mats. Um, there were some questions. Um, some of them were already answered in the chat by others, uh, which thanks to that. Um, I think. Um, If someone has some uh, question that I overlooked, please uh, please raise your hand. Uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate it uh, yourself. I realized that our um, idea of having 20, 30 minutes left for questions at the end didn't really <laughs> work out as planned. It was only three minutes now, but uh, uh, maybe if someone has time and want to stay a bit longer, that could be possible too. Uh, I just, it, while you're looking just for the questions, I just saw that there were some comments related to these calibrations with sensors commercially available, claiming to do a lot of analysis based on on some of the methodologies that we have mentioned. And I would say that there are this. Uh, I think in many cases it's important to take these promises uh, to be a bit critical to, to what some of these companies or these sensors are promised to, to measure, since quite often it's related to things that Mats and Christine and me talked about, which is indirect correlations that can be there in some cases and not in others. Um, so that's just a general comment and an issue, I think, in many of these uh, appearing um, uh, um, sensors and com companies um, selling products, producing a lot, um, promising a lot. I mean. Thank you very much. Oh, I see a raised hand by uh, Fanny van Egmond. Uh, Fanny, uh, please. Uh, uh, I will now turn off the um, recording. Uh, so uh, for uh, for the last discussion part. Yeah, I would just like to support Johanna's statement just now, and this is also 